said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. It means the pillars of his church will be at the gates, not with one leg in the sanctuary. And um, such things began to bother me. And as I went around discussing with heads of denominations and church leaders around Africa, we had regrets. And we were asking ourselves, where do we start? And so, on this platform, I'll be sharing some ways forward. And we hope that uh, you'll find time to listen. But for now, I just want to talk, talk about the revival revolution for a few minutes. October 31st, 2017. The whole world celebrated 500 years after Martin Luther's reformation. And there was this question, where do we go from here? November 1, in London, church fathers gathered and I was with them. And we laid the foundation and raised an altar for a revival revolution. Why do we need revival? Because when any change agent has, is weak, it becomes ineffective. If a drug has been weakened, it cannot cure any disease. If the church has become weak because of compromise, because of materialism, because of um, you know, the leaders going for fame, because of our trying to build another Babylonian empires, because of not just compromise, you know, falling into the terrible sins that should not be mentioned among sins. When we are weakened and we see the enemy rising and growing faster against the church, then you know that we need revival. God spoke to King Solomon sometime in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 from verse 13. He said, if I shut up the heavens and there be no rain, if it happens that my people begin to lose battles, that they should win. If there are pestilences, that means healings are not instantaneous, miracles don't take place as we, as we, as we you know, kind of advertise them. And uh, if we discover that the wicked are oppressing the righteous and the church is not growing as fast as it should grow, he said, if the heavens are shut, prayers are delayed, you know, answers to prayers are delayed. He said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, repent of their sins and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive them and I will heal their land. Today in our country, Nigeria, we have a great need to bring repentance as church leaders before the Lord. The younger generation, sometimes when they meet us and hear the things we say, the things we do in the secret, um, it's, it's very disheartening, very discouraging. And uh, many of them do not know who to believe in, who to trust, and where to go to. So from the top down, we all need to bring repentance before the Lord. Some of the famous big fathers in the Lord in this country will see evil and we will not say anything. We will keep quiet over abominable things happening before us. And many times, we will not investigate matters, we draw conclusions and take foolish decisions that hurt others and scatter the work of God. We need to bring repentance concerning our selfish approaches to ministry, our selfish approach to issues. It's either it's us or then it won't take place. We need to bring repentance concerning the fact that we're not able to play our prophetic roles to confront the wicked and to call sin, sin. We need to bring repentance concerning our negligences. If we have aggressively gone out evangelizing everyone, the sinners, the occult, those in false religions, they will not grow wings. They will have been saved and we will be in the trouble that we are today. So we need to come before the Lord and genuinely repent. That's where revival starts. The God said I will heal the land. When I see that, I will open the heavens and pour out revival. 
so I want to encourage every one of us to look inwards and stop pointing accusing fingers at A and B for we have failed God and ask for mercy cry out for mercy and then we will see a revival revival is inevitable it's very important now it's either we have a revival or the enemy will continue to push the church will continue to push the church we will continue to lose more grounds no the persecution global persecution will increase the, the tendency will increase it's either we have revival today or all that we have inherited from the apostolic era up to now will be erased either before us or immediately after us it's either we have revival today or we will hand over a dead church to the next generation so that we have revival today or our children will leave us and go and serve Satan because there's nothing exciting nothing nothing challenging anymore that they see in a church that's inactive that has become routine oriented it's just simply repeating the same things over and over again we need a revival today so that the joy of salvation will be will be returned we need a revival so that the presence of God will be returned to the church we need a revival so that the atmosphere will be recharged again and the power of God will become visible. And then the things we tell our children, they can see the evidences that Jesus is alive and that he is whom we claim that he is. We need a revival because the sinner needs to see something before he believes in what we believe. We need a revival because the light has grown so dim and if there's no revival, that light will go out. And the light of revival will brighten the atmosphere and increase our ability to create impact on our world. We need a revival because when there's a revival, the love of God is recharged. Genuine love is restored. There's excitement in the house when there's revival. What can a corpse do? Someone in coma. David said that the dead does not praise Jah. It's only when you are alive that you can praise the Lord and so we need a revival now as never now let me tell you that we are in a season that it has been prophesied we should have revival when William Seymour was concluding the corporate meetings at Azusa Street in 1913 he gave a prophetic word that 100 years from then there shall be a very great revival Big, much bigger than whatever had happened before. Uh, on the same day, on the sons, about the same time, Charles Parham, who was his teacher in the Bible College, gave the same prophetic word. Towards the end of 1913, Maria Woodward Etta gave the same prophetic word. Now, December 1913 to December 2013 is 100 years. So, from December 2014, till December 2018 that is four extra years we have left we have gone beyond the set time David Kossab talks about set time we are now in the added few hours you know after play no normal soccer time is 90 minutes and if you see them playing in the field 94 minutes it means they have injury time God has given us a little bit of injury time we are in the injury time, the added time to help us make the impact we have failed to make about four years ago. And what will it tell God when we get to heaven? What we will tell posterity that in our day we, were, we failed God. We failed God. When you look at Acts chapter 2, you know, Paul, Peter said, that which was prophesied by Joel, that's what we have brought to you. He, they were able to, there was a, an apostolic company that at the upper room brought the power of God to their generation. When you read Daniel chapter 9 verse 2, he said, and I read from the books concerning the prophecy concerning Israel. He said, and I began to pray and I seek the Lord. And the Bible says in chapter 10, that the very moment he began to pray, the ancient of days gave instruction that they be released. And is there nobody out there who is burdened with the fact that we are supposed to fulfill prophecy and it's not being fulfilled. We are four years behind schedule. So, 
it's very important it's very vital it's is prophet it's something prophesied that must be fulfilled this prophecy must come to pass somebody somewhere must catch this button and drive this revival for the previous revivals that we have had certain men human beings not spirit not angels drove those revivals the first great awakening was driven by George Whitefield between 1740 and 1770 and then the first great awakening took place between 1730 and 1755 for 25 years those guys broke hard grounds they began preaching in prison they began preaching in, in odd places they went to the swamps and preached to the poor and then they began to preach on the streets before they appeared in the stadium but then they refused to be silenced until the world began to pay attention to them D. L. Moody was one of them that was involved in the first great awakening David Brainerd was one of them that was involved in the first great awakening and then there came Charles G. Finney in the second great awakening William and Catherine Booth in the third great awakening these were names of people actual names in the early 1900 Evan Roberts a 27 year old boy in 1904 and then William Seymour an, un, an uneducated black man all these people were involved in what today we call great moves of God there were pillars that drove this work pillars 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 that drove this work I therefore challenge us at this broadcast to rise up and become a pillar of revival become the revival yourself become the revival yourself become the revival yourself Isaiah 64 verse 1 he said you know a time came when he realized that um, he had to call God by himself to do something and what did he say oh that you will rain the heavens that you will come down that the mountains might shake at your presence as fire burns brushwood as fire causes water to boil to make your name known to the adversaries that the nations may tremble at your presence I need somebody to pray that prayer I need somebody to help me bring God down to this generation there shouldn't be a godless generation every generation must test God can somebody help me like Isaiah you know cry out to God and ask him to move from heaven rent the heavens come down to the earth you no know, touch the mountains again and let them smoke and let the mountains sh shake again and and let men fear God like at Mount Horeb as you hear this message may the Lord take sleep away from your eyes and give you a body to pray and cry out until there's an outbreak of revival let it be something you've given to your generation that the next generation will collect fire from us a living church not a dead church that they will not be talking about the history of the names I had mentioned before but they will talk about inspiration drawn from the action of you and your name at a time like this from time to time you know I'll come to this platform and I'll share these things with you and I want to pray with you a few minutes dear Heavenly Father I'm praying for my brothers who are watching this and listening to this Lord some of them have strayed away some of them have been distracted they are pursuing fame they are trying to be the best impress people they are trying to one thing or the other you know had taken them off track the Lord I pray as they return to you with tears as they ask for forgiveness that you will forgive them some have backsliding they are still preaching they are still going to church but they are living in immorality they are living in sin lies is a system of doing their business father forgive them convict them of iniquity and Lord return them to you and as they return to you set their hearts ablaze with holy fire Lord start your revival let this generation not 
pass away without strong witness of who you are. Like Isaiah prayed, rent the heavens. Lord, let your feet touch the mountains. Let the echo of your voice be heard in the four corners of the earth. Let the nations tremble. Let people return to the God that is God because they have realized who you are by your manifestations. And I ask that you bless the effort of everybody who will try. Father, whatever effort anybody makes, please bless that effort that our generation will have a witness. Thank you, everlasting Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.